I don't usually get too bullish, especially what's what's when going on in the world today. But I got to tell you, I read this report, and uh, it is probably the most bullish report I've read in quite some time. Everybody, welcome to Digital Asset News on a Sunday. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. And what I'm talking about, let's just jump right into it, is there is this report from Citigroup, uh, Citibank, and GPS. And in case you don't know, uh, Citigroup, they are the third largest U.S. bank, largest in the world, excuse me, third largest in the United States. But in the world itself, largest bank worldwide as of December 2021, this is going to change. It's been quite some time. This is from Statista. You're looking at Citigroup just in that number 11 spot. And just above them, of course, a couple of banks from France and UK, but Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, and then, of course, some Chinese banks. But, I mean, as far as, like, uh, assets, $2.2 trillion versus, you know, yeah, as far as uh, JP Morgan, 3.7, somewhere in between. I mean, not too bad. It's a pretty good one. And this report itself, I got to tell you, again, I don't get too, too bullish on, on these things, but this one makes me sit up and take notice. And it's very, it's very comprehensive. It's very in-depth. It's 162 pages. We are not going to go over all that. But I linked this report in the, in the uh, description so you can check it out yourself because there's just a plethora of great information on this one. I just want to go over a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I just wanted, want you to take a gaze on who they talk to to put this report together. And I'm not saying that they're, they're picking winners, but it is interesting who they're talking to. Uh, you've got uh, Stani from Ave. You've got uh, Silvio McCauley from Algorand. Uh, CEO of Zinfin. You've got John Wu, president of uh, Avalanche, Avalanche Labs. And Ryan Wyatt, president of Polygon Labs. And of course, there's a couple other ones here that's... Uh, uh, are part of uh, blockchain and digital asset community. But if you take a look at those, they reach out to those people for a, a reason. I'm not saying they are the winners. They're the ones that are going to uh, make it. But it is interesting who they talk to. So this is what it comes down to itself, the report. Again, very comprehensive, very long. I'm just going to give you the highlights. And it talks about the potential for tokenization via blockchain. It's been talked about as being transformative for the past few years. We believe we're approaching an inflection point where the promised potential of blockchain will be realized, be measured in billions of users and trillions of dollars in value. Successful adoption will be when blockchain has a billion plus users who don't even realize they are using the tech. And that's the big thing. If you don't realize that you are using crypto and blockchain technology, that's when you win. I was around in the days before the internet. And when the internet came about, it was sucked. It was, pain to, it was a pain to use. You had to use you know, this great AOL dial-up. And sometimes you'd have to you know, get in there and, and the, uh, there was a lot of, of bugs to it. And you realize what was going on. But nowadays, people don't realize all the things that are happening behind the scenes. They don't know the payment processing. They don't know the different... Uh, aspects that are happening to actually make the internet actually flow. Now, in the old days, you had to. So right now, they're right. We're in this part where we just, we just, we understand what's going on. And we have to jump through a bunch of hoops, and that's not where we're going to be. And actually, I'm going to have, uh, as far as things to look at, uh, Amp Token and Flexa. I'm going to have the, uh, the founder, Tyler Spaulding, on. And he's going to talk about uh, how these two projects work. I like these projects, especially this one called Flexa. And I was watching Paul Barone. And it's great because like, you can use all these different crypto and payment options, the dollar being one of them. And he just talks about how what's great about when you use this, you don't realize the rails that are going on in the background. So like, I see these types of things of being when we win. Right now, it's just not there so far. Anyhow, we'll talk to him on April 12th. So to continue with this one, this will be a little bit controversial. This is likely to be driven, as far as like adoption, by the adoption of CBDCs, or central bank digital currencies, by large central banks, as well as tokenized assets in gaming and blockchain-based payments and social media. I got to agree. CBDCs are coming, whether we like them or not. But I tell you, there's a way around it. I'll get to that in a second. 
And in 2030, there'll be up to $5 trillion of CBDCs, which could be circulating in major economies in the world, half or which could be linked to distributed ledger technology or tech. Tokenization of financial and world war assets could be the killer use case, driving blockchain breakthrough with tokenization. Expected to grow by a factor of 80x in private markets and reach up to almost a $4 trillion value by 2030. I got to tell you, on this report, I think they're, they're understating some numbers. And what I'm talking about is there's this report I always pull out. This is all the world's money in a, in a visualization. So they talk about $4 trillion like that's going to be the end all be all. I don't think so. I think there's a lot of room to run, especially with the global financial markets. So again, each one of these little squares is 100 billion. And this is in this is from 2020, oh, 2020, this is old. But anyhow, there's a lot more on the Fed's balance sheet, I can tell you right there. That's only 7 trillion. Gold, it was a 10.9 trillion, it's about 11, 12 trillion now. Fortune 500 companies, the stock market has over 100 trillion now. Again, tokenization of assets. Money supply is much higher. Global debt, 253 trillion, that's even much higher now. Global real estate, 280 trillion, 280 trillion. Just imagine getting a fraction of that for tokenization of assets. And that will dwarf our 1.28 trillion market cap right now. Global wealth and of course derivatives, futures, forward swaps, all that stuff, right? That's like that's a quadrillion. So when they talk about in this report about you know four trillion in value by 2030, I think they're kind of undershooting. But hey, I'll take a little bit of uh, conservative estimations. To be successfully adopt the mainstream blockchain needs the help of technology enablers including decentralized digital IDs, zero knowledge proofs, oracles, and secure bridges. And this is the thing that gets people, decentralized digital IDs, because they're like, why do we need that? I don't understand because now, now the government has my information. Well, with zero knowledge proofs, you just have to prove a certain aspect of it. Right now, when you log into, I mean, anything, you gotta give a ton of information, right? Social security, date of birth, all that stuff, which is kind of ridiculous. But if you can just prove in one aspect that you are who you say you are, you don't have to give everybody all this information. And that's, I think, the bigger issue. So the reason we live in an age where we lose so much info on the internet and it's just hacked and it's out there for everyone to see, our children and our children's children won't have that issue. They'll hopefully go through these digital IDs or zero knowledge proofs. They don't have to give up much information. They only give what is required and needed to be. And this is the big thing. We think mass adoption could still be six to eight years away. Let me say that one more time. Mass adoption, six to eight years away. If you're like me, that's a sigh of relief. Because, and why is that? Well, it's because I think I know where we're going. I'm not for sure. I've been wrong before. I'm not, uh, not Nostradamus for Pete's sakes. But I mean, if I have all this time to invest in dollar cost average, that's fantastic. And if, if things just kind of build up, now there's going to be peaks and valleys. We're gonna have some big pullbacks, that is true. But I mean, six to eight years, what could you do? I mean, you're super early right now. What could you do in eight years, just slowly investing? Like, I can't give you investment advice, but I mean, think about that. That's a long time to really get into it. For us to go from one trillion market cap to three trillion, back to where we were before, to five trillion. And of course they say it's around four or five trillion. But what if it goes to eight trillion or nine trillion or 10 trillion in eight years? What would the market caps look, or what would the, or your favorite project look like then? I don't know, because all of them are not gonna make it, I'll tell you that right now. But uh, it does make me think that, for me personally, I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time, and I just got lucky. So, uh, momentum on adoption has positively shifted as governments, large institutions, and corporations have moved from investigating the benefits of tokenization to trials and proofs of concept, or, you really want to look at it in the U.S. just fighting us because they're scared. But that's just how it is. And then this part here. And it goes over three pieces. And again, it talks about the very first thing that's really going to bring adoption is CBDCs. I know that's like a bad, disgusting word, right? It's, a, it's an ugly four-letter word, Rob. You shouldn't use CBDCs. They're coming. It's going to happen anyhow. Just let it happen. It's going to be okay. Why is it gonna be okay? Because it'll screw up in some way, shape, or form. That's why, <laughs> just, like, just like banks, we just saw the banks collapse. We saw people couldn't pull their funds out. Fractional reserve banking. How long do you think it's gonna be 
to where you have an authoritarian government, like in China, how long do you think it's going to be before they start shutting off their own countrymen's ability to spend funds for whatever reason in this social metric that they have? And just say, you know what, you can't do that. And you're stuck in the system so much. Sorry. Well, you can get out of that system. So absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when you have those CBDCs and you have the government who, have the, who has that ability to do those things, they will screw around and they will mess up. And it only takes one time. We're not living in the 1940s when I had to send a letter to somebody to get their attention. All I got to do is just set on a tweet, just put an information and go, they shut me down. If you don't want to be a part of that system, exit out of the matrix and get into Bitcoin, digital assets and crypto. So for me, when people talk about CBDCs, I'm like, I don't see the problem. It's just give them, give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves. And that's, that's it. So I will guide your attention to this middle part right here. And this is interesting. With over 3 billion gamers currently, let me, how many people are in the world? Like 7 billion going on 8 billion, something around there? I always forget. Somewhere around, I'm pretty sure it's below 10 billion, but 3 billion gamers. Uh, that's a lot of people. And they say we expect 50 million, 100 million could be Web3 users by 2025 with estimates rising as Web2 hits include tokens. Let me read that one part again. With estimates rising as Web2 hits include tokens. It's not only the Web2 hits. It's not only the Fortnites and the League of Legends and all the different things that are out there that are going to go into Web3 and bring that in. It's all the losers, all the loser games that are out there that never got picked up. Those are the ones that are like, you know what? What could really give us an edge is no one really wanted to play our game here in Web 2. Let's just move over to Web 3. And then before you know it, you have a plethora of games that no one gave a, a C about. And now they're using Web 3. They're like, oh, this is awesome because we can do this either play to earn or win to earn. That's where I think things are going to shine. But just pay attention to what they're talking about here. This second one, 3 billion gamers. And of course, the last piece, arts. Collectibles, NFTs, digital collectibles could create a new paths for content. Monetization opportunities. Then it talks about some all the funds that are in the world, zero knowledge proof, legal enablers, smart contracts, legal parts. Again, this is a great, this is just a great resource to read. It's 162 pages again. I'll let you read it. It gives you everything you really want to know about CBDCs, about gaming, about smart contracts, about oracles. Uh, I mean, everything you really want to know. Art, NFTs, tokenization of assets, trade finance. I mean, just great. So, but I want to focus on is just the four things, just to give you like the big overview. So there's, there's, well, there's three things here. Four key takeaways. CBDCs in a distributed ledger technology or not. And then we're going to talk about Polygon and Ryan Wyatt. So let's just start here. It's page 10, 26, and 38. So let me just scroll down here. Okay, here's the takeaway from the report. There's going to be a lot of users. Get ready for CBDC version. CBDC versions of the euro and British pound and Indian rupee. Together, these four jurisdictions constitute more than 25% of the global population, 22% of global bank deposits. There are big figures for gaming, over 3 billion gamers. This means only a relative small portion of gamers need to participate in blockchain-based games so then it'd be a success. Gaming will lead the way in making blockchain big. From a bottom-up perspective, gamers from Asia will likely adopt the next generation Web3 in the next one or two years. They're already doing it right now. Triggering inclusion of tokenization aspects by leading Western and global game studios. They'll lead and will follow. Web2 or mass market consumer brands will be the key driver of adoption. So Web3 will not replace Web2, but will nestle inside it, Russian doll-like. What they're talking about here is, again, you're gonna have these Web2 versions and they're gonna cross over to Web3 because either their game is lagging, their game never really was great, or maybe it's just they just want a new aspect of it. And I think that is going to push up gaming because there's so many games out there. It doesn't matter if you're like, first of all, I'm not a big gamer, as you might tell. <laughs> but casual gaming, sure, if I got to kill some time, why not, right? So I do something like this, this will be the big push. Also, art and collectibles are also moving onto the blockchain. That would be interesting. And then it talks about entertainment such as music. We'll use blockchain tech in the form of NFTs. Sure. So everything will use NFTs. So when we're talking about these, these, these stuff, all these things, think about it this way. I don't want you to think about the games themselves are going to be awesome 
or the music that's going to be awesome. I want you to think about the rails of which these will be built upon. So if you can think about, well, where is this going to? What are the rails? This is why I always talk about layer one solutions, whether that be Ethereum or a Cardano or a Polkadot or an Avalanche or whatever you want to talk about. Are the things that I own because I'm biased and I talk about things I'm biased on. Think and take a look at that of what things will be built on and also on layer two solutions because there's only so many rooms, room for layer one. Layer two might be the next big, next big part. Second, trillions of value. Tokenization of financial real world assets is en route. Moreover, almost anything of value can be tokenized. They talk about wine and art, building skyscrapers. Your car can be tokenized. Your property could be tokenized. I don't know, maybe even a person can be tokenized. I'm not for sure. Technology enablers, digital IDs, which we just talked about, zero knowledge proofs, oracles, and secure bridges. If they can get a bridge to work that's secure and not get hacked all the time, I think that'd be awesome. But there's just one thing here, oracles. Oracles are just, it's the ability to take outside real world data and stick them, gather them and put them into the blockchain. How many oracles do you know? How many oracles do you know right now off the top of your head that you could buy, that you can get into? I'm not telling you what to do, no financial advice. I'm just saying, to me, there's only two oracles that I know of. There's, there's probably some other ones. No, there is actually three. Uh, Chainlink, which everybody knows about. And you're like, well, if everything needs an Oracle and the city's talking about that, that might be something to look at. There's one called Band, which Band is being used by Cosmos. So that gives something else to look at too. There's one called uh, Charlie, which is also which is being used on the Cardano blockchain. So again, if they're so big onto uh, Oracles, well, how many Oracles are out there? Not that many, quite honestly. And then legal enablers, contract 2.0 is underway with the development of smart contracts or else we'll see. And lastly, to finish this part up, according to Aaron Powers, co-founder of uh, Hunt, these contracts will provide a whole new set of rails for global commerce and finance to run on. There are multiple use cases ranging from property to service level agreements. Again, take a look at what this will be run on. So that was that section, pretty interesting. Now let's get into the CBDC part. Because I know everybody's freak, everybody freaks out about CBDCs. I could... I was the same way, actually. I was kind of scared because what I would think about CBDCs, I'm like, especially when I first got in, I was like, oh, no. Central bank digital currencies, well, now, you know, what is the whole point of, of Bitcoin? Because it's all for, for transactions and payments. And if CBDCs come in and Fed now come in, well, what's going to be? Of course, this is before I knew the greater aspects and what it was and stores of value actually getting out of the system itself, non-fraction reserve lending, all that stuff. So with this part, again, CBDCs are coming. Even, uh, even Simon Dixon from Bank the Future I've had on here a couple of times, just like, look, it's just gonna move this way and that's just how it is. And me and him both agree. It's just, it's just long enough for them to screw it up. So for here, They state, we ex and I never thought about this part either. So this is why I thought it was so interesting. We expect some major CBDCs in full or in part could also be blockchain-based. Blockchain-based, not just centralized, but on a distributed ledger technology. However, they do, they do state major sovereigns appear to want to primarily rely on a centralized ledger due to policy preferences. Like China's not going to give up. They're not going to put it on Ethereum or something like that. They're just not gonna, it's not going to happen because they want the power. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And they want that to lock everything down, just like they locked down their poor citizens during the coronavirus. We expect cross-border CBDCs, however, could be primarily distributed ledger technology or blockchain-based. Why? For the sake of ease, ease and because it could bring down the cost and time of foreign exchange transfers, thereby creating operational efficiencies. And this was the most important. I didn't know this. This is, like I said, this is a great report. Figure, figure seven, select central banks CBDC projects. Did you know? First of all, everything's kind of starting in 2021, 2022. Australia, for wholesale and retail, their CBDC project is based on Ethereum. Again, layer one. Bhutan, I'm sure I said that right as on XRP Ledger. Canada, well, R3 Corda, that's pretty centralized. 
DL3S, DSC, Hyperledger Fabric in Nigeria, that's centralized. Ethereum for Saudi Arabia, Hyperledger, and Quorum, and some other ones don't know. But I just found it interesting that, you know, just here, you've got Saudi Arabia, Australia, and some of those we don't know so far. But they're like, yeah, we'll use CBDC and we're going to base it on Ethereum tech. Well, I like that. That sounds pretty good. And then to wrap this up, the last part about gaming, which I think is the next big thing, which is what I want to try to push my channel a little bit more to. I want to start talking about Web3 gaming coming up. The news will always be the news. We'll talk about Bitcoin. We'll talk about layer one solution, things that are going on, right? But I want to leave a segment at the end just to talk about Web3 gaming. I think there's massive potential here. Okay. So this is Ryan Wyatt from Polygon Labs. They asked him, why do we need blockchain-based games? How early are we likely to see new releases? And he said, it's an increased number of gamers who buy in-game assets and merchandise want the ability to sell or trade it, much like they can do with physical items in the real world. Why have early blockchain-based games? Because the other ones, the play-to-earns, haven't been successful, Axie. The model doesn't functionally work from a tokenomics perspective. The economics, economics of play-to-earn games are often structured in a complex manner. Most games also tend to be very rudimentary and not much fun to play, i.e. they suck, they're boring. Consumers, and this is a good point, consumers didn't ask developers for cloud gaming or multiplayer games or mobile games or play-to-earn games. And they're certainly not going to ask for blockchain-based games, but now that they're here, those 3 billion people that play those games tend to like those things. Developers can also enforce creator royalties. I thought that was a pretty good idea. Allowing the content creator to receive royalties every time the digital item is sold. So you can do it right now. If you create a digital item in whatever game it is, you can sell it if you, if you have that ability and not all can do that. But wouldn't that be great is every time you, you create an item and you sell it and you get a little royalty, well, that's what happens in OpenSea and some other parts there. But hey, I'll take it. And then to finish up, who's likely to lead new blockchain-based game developments? And he says it's going to be Asia-Pacific Asia region, of course, like we talked about. And then he's, lastly, I am more fascinated by the potential revenue for in-game Web3 or blockchain-based assets. This is likely to be the big driving force for blockchain-based games. Even today, a small fraction of global gamers account for the lion's share of money being spent on games. Let's refer to them as whales. Now just imagine when you put that on steroids and you have all these different games out there. Maybe it's not play to earn. Maybe it's one called win to earn or something else. And they can all get into these games and then they can all make some kind of transaction or they can purchase these skins and these weapons and NFTs and just sell them everywhere they want to, not just within that game, but within a plethora of other games that are out there. And everything that can be done can all be done on the blockchain. Wouldn't that be interesting? Would some gamers hate that? I'm pretty sure they would because it's slow to change, right? I think some gamers would actually welcome that. And that's why I'll have Crypto Stash on the program, I think uh, Wednesday, and we'll talk about all those things. But I got to tell you, this report, there's a link in the description. Read the whole report. It uh, gives you great information and great insight. And uh, that's it for today. So look, thanks for stopping by. It's a Sunday. Thanks for stopping by and hanging out with me. That was fun talking about these bullish reports and where things are going. I can't give you price predictions, but I think we're in the right place at the right time. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing, all that good stuff. Now, if you want to hang around, let's chat, and uh, I'll go over some of your questions. That's it.